It wouldn't be immensely surprising, Bev. Um, of course, Western governments don't talk about their special forces activity. Their deployments are highly secretive. In fact, they, there is even very limited insight or oversight in, in my country, the UK, by parliament. I, I, know, I know the Defence Committee uh, of Parliament does not have uh, direct oversight of special forces activity. Uh, I don't believe the Intelligence and Security Committee does. Um, and you know, these are, these are very unaccountable means of influence. They're deployed with enormous secrecy. So it doesn't surprise me. I think what does surprise me is that we have um, so many British special forces allegedly in Ukraine. Of course, I can't uh, guarantee the authenticity of these documents, although I suspect they are in large part authentic. Um, the document suggests 50 British special forces, 15, I think 15 or so French special forces, many, many Latvian ones, um, a comparably small number of Americans. And I think it's very important to note, above all, that if they are present in Ukraine, the overwhelming likelihood is that these forces are training their Ukrainian counterparts, Ukrainian special forces. They are they are almost certainly not engaged in any kind of frontline role uh, or any combat role, which, which I just want to make completely clear for those who might imagine that these special forces are um, probing deep behind Russian lines in some sort of dangerous mission. I think that's exceedingly unlikely. Yeah, or orchestrating the Ukrainian offensive and defensive. But Shishank, you know, we've seen lots of theatres of war. Syria comes to mind where no rules were followed. Uh, would something like this, in, in putting special forces in a country like this and assisting Ukraine in some way, impact any boundaries of what is considered acceptable? Well, I think special forces always sit in that interesting grey zone of activity. Um, they don't really seem to count in the eyes of governments as boots on the ground. They're not uh, directly engaged in combat, they're advisory forces. Um, and I think in that sense, they don't really alter our view of the red lines. Um, if anything, I think the provision of more advanced sorts of weapons are the activities that have really stretched Western red lines, particularly the provision of long range rockets, the HIMARS rockets, the provision of Western tanks, Challenger 2s, Leopards, um, uh, British Abrams, uh, excuse me, American Abrams. Um, I think the question of personnel is much less important. And I think the really important thing to remember is um, the tactical impact of a special forces operative training up a Ukrainian in, in on Ukrainian soil can be much less than the tactical impact of a uh, intelligence analyst providing extremely sensitive targeting intelligence from their base somewhere in the continental United States. They might be far away, but they could still be having a disproportionate impact on the accuracy and effectiveness of Ukrainian long range strikes. So I wouldn't deem this to be some kind of uh, uh, overly provocative or, or a breaching of the existing red lines in Ukraine. Yeah. With regard to some of the other documents that have been uh, published, what are the most concerning to you? There's lots of very sensitive stuff. Again, if it is accurate, um, what we have is insight into the composition of every single uh, Ukrainian brigade, or at least all nine of them that are being armed and trained by the West. The number of tanks, the number of artillery pieces, um, the exact number of other armored vehicles they have. You can infer from that, of course, Bev, which of those brigades is likely to be in charge of breaching Russian lines or breaching Russian minefields and, and other defensive positions. And so that will give the Russians a sense of which brigades to watch for the timing and location of the offensive. We also have details of the uh, which Ukrainian corps is likely to command the offensive, that's the Ukrainian 10th Corps. And we also have details of the precise uh, ammunition usage of um, Russian, uh, Ukrainian rockets, Ukrainian artillery, and most sensitive of all, Ukrainian surface-to-air missiles, along with the precise dates at which the United States thinks that these missiles will be exhausted in Ukraine's inventory. And I think that's, uh, again, if it is correct, if it's accurate, that's uh, extremely damaging for Ukraine. Yeah, quite alarming. Does it then change what the focus of the spring offensive has to be? Um, what might we see different? Or we, I mean, I guess we didn't really know. There was this element of surprise that the Ukrainians were trying to, to sort of have and protect. 
The information dates to late February, early March. And so a, a great deal will have changed in the five or six weeks that elapsed between uh, that, that revelation and, and any operation. Um, but I do think the Ukrainians will have to take some steps. They may mix up the composition of brigades. But of course, these units have trained as units at, at higher levels. And so there's, there's, there's not, not, it's not going to be easy to break them up or to mix up the units in them. Um, there's also, of course, some factors that um, can't change. The weather is one of them. One of the slides gives American intelligence assessments of how the muddy ground in Ukraine will change over time to become more favorable for what they call vehicle maneuver. In other words, when can you get vehicles over the ground without getting bogged down in mud? And the slide suggests that's going to happen in May. Um, roughly in the middle of May, depending on which part of Ukraine you look at. And again, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, that's an, an American assessment. But the weather is the weather, the terrain is the terrain, and the Ukrainians are going to have to live with that and simply adapt their operations to whatever the climate brings. Yeah. And of course, it also demonstrated, Shashank, that Russia is not isolated. We know, of course, that the support um, is getting from China, if not necessarily in weapons, but just even the constant financial support it gets through the purchase of its oil. But we saw the Egyptian president considering sending up to 40,000 rockets or ordering the production of 40,000 rockets. It, it, does, it shows you that Russia is also getting support. It does, um, although that slide was uh, about Egypt entertaining the idea of support, preparing for support. It didn't show uh, actual transfers of rockets. And indeed, today or, or yesterday, we saw John Kirby, a spokesman for um, uh, the uh, US government, say he hadn't seen transfers of Egyptian yeah. weapons. But you're right. And what the slides also show, according to one of the CIA assessments that is in that repository that I've reviewed, uh, it says that the the Chinese government would likely consider providing heightened assistance if Ukraine were to strike strategic locations inside Russia or to target the Russian leadership. And that would give them justification for escalating their support. But, you know, that, that's, again, um, you know, an indication they haven't done it yet. They're still holding back. Um, and, of course, the, the, on the flip side, what the documents show, Bev, is also that some countries who we might not have expected to provide support to Ukraine have been arming Ukraine. And Serbia, uh, a longstanding cultural uh, partner of Russia, a political ally of Russia, comes to mind. Serbia is providing aid to Ukraine. So I think, of course, it shows you that some of you, Russia's traditional friends are also helping the other side. Yeah. Always good to get you to make sense of this for us, Shashank. Thanks so much. Thank you.